Good morning. A couple of housekeeping things before we continue. Um, Friday, today, uh, 3 to 4 p.m. are my office hours. Can I get a rough show of hands to see who, I won't hold you to this, um, but who might be interested in going to office hours? It just depend on where we meet. Okay, so I'll plan on being in the atrium. Um, I'll, we'll just move some of the chairs together and we'll meet there instead of my office just because uh, we had several hands go up. Also, um, Monday's TA office hour, because it's a holiday, will be on Tuesday instead. And that's at 1 p.m. in the SME atrium. Any questions about the class or what I said before? <laughs> so, those TA office hours are only from 12 to 1 p.m.? Is that correct? It's just 1 p.m. Tuesday. Yeah, so it's You want to do it at what time? <clears throat> 1 p.m. Tuesday works better. 1 p.m. Tuesday. And if just you guys this <laughs> next week only. Generally, the syllabus will be correct, but. Next week, 1 p.m. as in the atrium. Okay, anything else? Cool. So, uh, last time we ended class with a discussion of what happens when light interacts with a molecule or a nanoparticle or a surface or a semiconductor. A lot of different things can happen. Um, and it's the basis of why things look the way they do. It's the basis of technologies like uh, anything based on uh, spectroscopy, anything based on, um, based on colorimetric changes in a, in a nanoparticle in response to, uh, say, uh, drug levels or, uh, say, a pregnancy strip or anything that involves light matter interactions. And in general, three things happen. Scattering, absorption, or nothing. Now, with the exception of nothing, Scattering and absorption can be further subdivided into a couple of different categories. So we talked about scattering, um, elastic scattering, Raleigh scattering, where a, uh, where a photon transiently polarizes an electron cloud in some particle, molecule, or object. And then upon depolarization of that, uh, that, um, uh, that electron cloud, photon is re-emitted at the same wavelength as the incoming photon. So that's elastic scattering. Inelastic scattering is where you have some molecule or, uh, or material or nanoparticle or surface that has some, uh, some vibrational state associated with some, uh, some part of it. So molecule is vibrating and then a photon comes in and the, the vibrational state of the molecule changes um, often it, it can either lose energy or increase in energy. Um, the, the one that we normally see, um, a, a uh, what's called a Stokes shifted process, don't worry about, uh, about memorizing that. Um, what happens is the molecule increases in vibrational frequency and the photon therefore loses energy. And in that case, if we know the energy of the photon that went in, and we can measure the energy of the photon that came out, we, we know what the difference in energy of the molecule was before and after this inelastic scattering process, which is pretty useful. And at the end of class, I mentioned something called uh, surface-enhanced Raman scattering. SIRS, which is really a quintessential nano, nano engineering phenomenon or phenomenon that's, that's useful in nano engineering. And I wasn't going to, to go into details on this. I just wanted to say what it was, but because there were some questions about it after class, I thought I would just I, uh, elaborate for a minute. If you have a surface of some metal, We picture metal surfaces as being shiny and smooth, 
but if you look at them very closely under an atomic force microscope or even an, an, an electron microscope, you'll notice that there are um, that there are asperities and dips and surface roughness that can be on the order of uh, of several nanometers even, and it still looks like uh, like a mirrored uh, surface. And what happens is that some of these uh, some of these uh, surface asperities, these nanoscale surface asperities, have these conduction electrons that will uh, that will uh, resonate uh, with a uh, with a particular wavelength of light that's irradiating uh, the uh, the nanostructure. And what happens is that the electric field, as that light is scattered, the electric field um, is is intense around the surface asperities. And this works not only for rough surfaces, but also intentionally designed nanoparticles, say nanocrystal that looks like a triangle. We call these, these spots uh, antennas, an antenna. I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> antennas, antenna. And what happens is that when there's a molecule in the vicinity, of, uh, of, of one of these um, one of these metallic nanostructured surfaces or particles, uh, the the Raman scattering the probability that a molecule will undergo Raman scattering goes way up by many many orders of magnitude. So uh, so this can be used as a spectroscopic technique. For example, if you put um, if you put nanoparticles in the bloodstream and you shine a, a Raman laser at them. The scattered uh, and, and there is some molecule of interest in the bloodstream and you have some optical window with which you can look at it and you measure the scattered photon you can measure the, uh, the, the presence or absence of these molecules say in the bloodstream or in some in, in a cell in some biological uh, milieu yeah That's a good question. So the, the question was, uh, what sort of computational power would you need to make sense of those measurements? Um, it depends on, probably depends on your, the time resolution that you need. Um, in general, the, uh, the wavelength resolution doesn't really produce that much data, but if, you're, if, if you have many, many signals, it probably requires some serious uh, deconvolution. Um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. Okay, so absorption. Absorption is uh, is can of of uh, electromagnetic energy can be accomplished through a few different uh, molecular mechanisms. In the low energy regime, we have rotational and vibrational. rotational and vibrational modes that appear in the IR. And these are quantized differences in literally the frequencies at which, or the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the oscillations of electron density in a, uh, in a molecule uh, can, uh, can go. So for example, um, you have some modes that are higher in energy than, uh, than others. So molecules will, the nuclei and molecules will shake back and forth, but if you have a more complicated molecule, you might have bending and breathing modes too, and it takes certain amounts of energy to get from, uh, it takes quantized amounts of energy, so that is set, set uh, differences in energy to get from one vibrational mode to another. And we can use that in a type in, in vibrational spectroscopy. In fact, the surface and headers, the Raman scattering in general is related to vibrational spectroscopy and you can actually access some of these modes using the Raman effect. So as I alluded to, you can, you can watch the, uh, uh, you, can, you can measure the differences in vibrational frequencies by probing with a laser and then measuring the difference uh, in, in energy of the scattered, uh, of the scattered um, uh, photon. 
Electronic absorption is more familiar to us as a day-to-day -day phenomenon because things have, uh, things have colors and that's largely a result of uh, electronic absorption. And electronic absorption can really be uh, UV visible uh, or IR, generally near IR, so higher energy um, IR wavelengths. Hello. Um, in the lecture today, I made a little bit of a mistake when I was talking about the uh, uh, absorption and emission from, uh, from the valence band to the conduction band. Um, I actually have the, the nomenclature backwards, and I think I said it wrong a few times later on in the lecture. I'm sorry about that. I'm, uh, I hope to, uh, to make amends uh, uh, right now and make sure that I explain it correctly. So in the case of electronic absorption, what happens is that a photon comes into a material, and this could be a quantum dot or a semiconductor or a bulk semiconductor or, uh, or really any material, but we think about it particularly in the cases of materials that absorb in the UV, invisible, and, and near IR uh, uh, regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, in a case of electronic uh, absorption is the promotion of an electron from the uh, valence band to the conduction band. And a diagram uh, is, uh, is as follows. So suppose you have two band uh, edges. And later on today, we will talk about the band edges in the, uh, in the form of molecular orbitals of beta carotene. And we have an electron here, and this is the valence band, and this is the conduction band. And what happens when a photon comes in, and a photon is given the signal of a symbol um, h nu, or this is Planck's constant, and nu is the frequency of the photon. What happens is that a photon is absorbed here. And the next state that we have leaves a hole, sometimes called little h with a plus. This is not Planck's constant, and it's definitely not a hydrogen ion. Um, it's a, it's a, a hole. Sometimes it's called an electron hole because an electron is missing uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the valence band. And the electron is now somewhere here in the conduction band. And it doesn't go necessarily, uh, unless you're really lucky, exactly up to the band edge. What it does is it sort of, it, it, uh, it can overshoot. And it overshoots with a probability based on what's called the density of states above this band uh, edge because you can have a say a low density of states here and then maybe maybe a high density of states here and then maybe lower over here and maybe higher up here and it depends on the idiosyncrasies of the material that you're using and this is why when you take a a, uh, a uv visible spectrum of a quantum dot or a semiconductor or an organic dye you don't get just a line that corresponds to exactly the band gap, usually get a broad, lazy absorption, and that is due to the fact that we have densities of states both in the valence band and the conduction band. So what happens after absorption, typically, is that this electron is high in energy, and usually over a very short time scale, it will, uh, it will kind of find its way to the, band, uh, to the band edge. And we call this process thermalization, Uh, thermalization to the band edge. And what happens when 
the electron thermalizes, and now it's back to the band edge, is that this energy is given off as heat. or molecular vibrations. Molecular or bond uh, vibrations. So now we are at the, uh, at the band edge. And this loss in energy here is important to, uh, is, is important under understanding why a fluorescent photon we'll get to that in a second, has less energy than the photon of excitation under normal circumstances. So then what happens is, uh, is emission Is emission down to the valence band and it doesn't necessarily have to go exactly to the band uh, to the valence band edge it could it could overshoot uh, it depends on the uh, on the on the density of states in the valence band um, but in general this uh, the photon that's emitted here we'll call this H nu prime this is uh, a photoluminescent photon. Photon. And this could be one of two types of photoluminescent photons. It could be a fluorescence event. Fluorescence is the normal case where electrons, uh, an electron goes up to the valence band uh, up to the conduction band, sorry, there I go again, I don't know why I'm doing that, goes up to the conduction band, thermalizes to the band edge, and then, uh, and then goes back down to the valence band, concomitant with the emission of a uh, photon with the energy that is equivalent to the gap, the amount of energy that was, uh, that, that was uh, traversed um, here. We can also have uh, phosphorescence, And I won't go into details onto phosphorescence. Uh, you can read about it uh, on your own if you'd like. But basically what happens in phosphorescence is that somewhere up here, the electron changes its spin. So spin, it could be spin up and spin down. When electrons are in the same molecular orbital or the same, uh, the same, um, uh, the same band, uh, they and it occupy the same energy, they can't have the same spins. So they have opposite spins, but then when one electron is promoted to the, uh, to the conduction band, it can, some event can happen, and some materials are better at doing this than others, that the, uh, the, the spin can, can switch. And now it can't, now it can't go down again. So it has to, uh, so there's some uh, long process that it takes in order for the for the spins to uh, to be uh, anti-parallel again, so that the electrons can uh, the electron can go back to the valence band, and that is a uh, can is a long process in phosphorescence. And for some materials, phosphorescence can take place over the order over the time scale of minutes. It can take minutes for the electrons um, uh, in a phosphorescent compound to return to the. Uh, to the valence band, and that's what uh, that's the basis of glow in the dark materials. So some of you may have had, uh, I did, um, had those stars, uh, those glow in the dark stars on your bedroom ceiling, uh, and then over um, over the course of the night, they slowly um, they slowly uh, uh, die down to uh, to nothing. So um, so this is uh, this is electronic uh, absorption. And what else can happen after absorption is you can either have de-excitation somehow or, uh, or transfer. So de-excitation, this is de-excitation of an absorbed 
photon. The excitation of an electron that it was promoted to, to a higher energy level because of an absorbed photon. And de excitation has a couple of routes that it can take non radiative, in this, in this case, it's like thermalization, but the electron is the energy of the electron uh, goes to the uh, goes to bond vibrations and heat. Or you can have what are called radiative uh, de excitation, which is photoluminescence. And again, this is fluorescence. excited state energy transfer the, the excited state energy can happen in a number of ways for example if you're up in the conduction band and there's another species nearby that has uh, that has a, a lower energy conduction band the electron can go from one conduction band to another conduction band, and then and then so on down. Um, these types of uh, of uh, transfer processes are the basis of how photosynthesis works and solar cells work, um, and, uh, and 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 so that's something that can happen. You can transfer uh, transfer the energy. You can also have uh, re-emission uh, um, emission of, of a photon, and then absorption of the photon by another. Uh, another species, or you can have uh, the wave functions of, of one, an excited chromophore and, an, and a ground state chromophore. And by chromophore, I just mean a system of, of, uh, of, of valence band and conduction band um, uh, systems that, uh, uh, that absorb light. So chromophore, chromo color. Uh, um, so what you can have is the wave functions of an excited state chromophore and a, de -ex and a, and a ground state chromophore overlap, and then you can actually transfer the energy from one to another without involving the uh, emission of any photons uh, whatsoever. And the third alternative um, is that uh, nothing happens. So nothing happens when a photon comes into contact with some, some matter. Um, there's a probability associated with uh, what's called the absorption cross-section of the material, which are not the same for every, uh, every structure. That depends on the details of the, of, the, uh, of the molecular quantum mechanics, and don't worry about that for, the, for our uh, purposes. All right, thank you. Back to the classroom. Okay, let's use what we have learned about emission, absorption and, and emission, to answer the question, why are carrots orange? Of all questions. One of the effects of size confinement is of quantization of energy. And in fact, when you have a semiconductor or an organic dye and you shrink it down, you just make it smaller, you remove atoms and stuff, you actually change the allowed energies of a particle confined within that space. And this is one of the key properties of nanostructured materials, particularly nanostructured semiconductor materials, which are important in imaging, computation, uh, uh, bioimaging, biosensing, solar cells, 
let's say, I'm making this up, 75% of nanoengineering is due to size confinement of uh, electronic structures. Of course, when I get to the bio applications, I'm gonna say 75% is due to uh, the ability to interact with biomolecules on the right scale. But anyway, um, this, is, this is, it's a big deal, it's a big deal. Anyone ever heard of a particle on a box, maybe from a chemistry class? Okay, so this is, that, that's sort of a, a, a model, and we're gonna explore it here in the context of an organic semiconductor that says that when you shrink the size of the box, you increase the energies of the allowed, uh, the allowed wave functions of that, uh, of that particle, in this case an electron, within the box. The more confined it is, the higher in energy it is. You can think of it like if you're stuck in your house all weekend because of a snowstorm, which they don't have in San Diego, but suppose they did. If you're stuck in your house and you're confined, you start to start to freak out because so you're bouncing off the walls, you have really high energy, and that's what happens. That's what happens to particles. Whereas if you're well, I don't know, whatever. Okay, confining confining particles. particle in a box and what we hope to do is answer the question why are carrots orange okay I'm going to draw an organic structure on the board, and, I, and organic chemistry is not, a, not required for this class, but I'm going to teach you what you need to know in the next five minutes. Do not freak out as I draw this. First, you draw your TV with the rabbit ear antennas. This is called beta carotene, called carotene because it was derived from celery. Just kidding. Biosynthetically, what this is derived from is another molecule called isoprene. which looks like this. What on earth do these lines and angles mean? I'll tell you. First, I want to say beta carotene. You can actually make a solar cell out of beta carotene. You can take a carrot and squeeze it and like wring it out like a towel and get the orange juice that comes out, evaporate all the juice, take out all the salts and stuff, you're left with some other stuff too, but a lot of beta carotene. And if you actually put that beta carotene, and assuming it's purified enough in between two different metals and shine light at it, assuming one of the metals is thin enough to allow light through, you can actually make what's called a Schottky photodiode, which is a solar cell. It's gonna be a pretty crappy solar cell, but it will work. It will actually, if you had like a room of, of carrot solar cells, you could probably power like one hundredth of a pixel on a digital watch, but it would work. And you can make materials deliberately that work a lot better than beta carotene, and therefore, uh, you you know you can power like like a few light bulbs. Oh, solar energy! How I how I love thee, but how depressing you are. This is called a molecular semiconductor.
So I want to give you an aside on how to read structures like that. So chemistry to me means transformation of stuff to other stuff and where electrons go from one molecule to another. But just to be able to read an organic structure, you don't need to know anything about chemistry. It's just like reading a blueprint. So this is an aside on organic structures. This is benzene. What does this really mean? Let me draw another one. Do we believe that's a molecule? Yeah. It is. This is propane. And what did we do? Each kink here is a carbon atom. All the kinks in the structure are carbon atoms. So all, the, all these vert vertices are carbon atoms. Each carbon atom has four things bonded to it. If we didn't draw all the things that are bonded to carbon, then you assume that the missing elements to which carbon is bonded are hydrogen atoms. And those rules describe how we get from here to here. So the kinks and, uh, and uh, termini are carbon. Carbon has four bonds. The third rule is that hydrogen atoms are not, the H's are not drawn. Four is that all other atoms are drawn. It's ironic that organic chemistry can be considered, organic structures can be considered the structures comprising carbon and hydrogen, but it's ironic that carbon and hydrogen are the only elements that we don't draw. Okay. Beta carotene has a particular molecular structure which has these alternating double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, all the way across the molecule. And what happens from, from uh, general chemistry, we know that these sp2 hybridized carbon atoms have these, these figure eight like, like orbitals that go in and out of the plane of the board. I see a lot of um, size as, as though you thought you'd never see this again and that it was very unimportant. What happens when you have lots and lots and lots of these, uh, these, these orbitals, one after the other after the other, is that an electron can live in these, this system and just go from one side of the molecule to the other with relative freedom. And what happens when you have that, uh, that scenario 
is that the electrons can delocalize. This thing becomes a one-dimensional particle in a box. It becomes the box for an electron that has, that's one-dimensional because the electron can live in this, these p orbitals, or these pi bonds between p orbitals that extend across the entire molecule. And as a result, the electrons have quantized energy levels, which produces a valence band and a conduction band, and therefore absorption uh, by, uh, by visible uh, ultraviolet or near IR uh, light. So we have 22 sp2 hybridized carbon atoms and in each one of these carbon atoms it contributes one electron each into this system of of what's called pi conjugation, which just means alternating double single, double single, double single bonds. So we have 22 pi electrons and from chemistry we know that we have 22 uh, pi electrons, 22 uh, sp2 hybridized carbon atoms. We have 22 molecular orbitals. Everything is 22 so far. Everything's 22 so far. But these orbitals, each one that forms, can fit two electrons each. And because you don't want to have electrons that are way high in energy, when they could be could have lower energy, you fill them up from the bottom. Two, two in the first one, two in the second one, two in the third one, two in the fourth one, and so on. So the first eleven are filled, and the next eleven are vacant. So we call these eleven uh, bonding molecular orbitals. and 11 antibonding Mohs molecular orbitals. Okay, now we go from one topic that you hated from chemistry to a topic that maybe you also hated from physics. And together, we'll combine them and to answer the question, why are carrots orange? This is a one-dimensional box. It has sides that are infinitely tall, and the potential energy on the outside of the box is infinite. This is x-axis, and this will be 0, and this will be L, which is the length of the box. The potential energy inside the box is 0, so it's all kinetic energy inside the box. Schrodinger equation. What goes in the box? There's, there's, there's no other way to say it. Schrodinger equation. Okay. Not everybody's favorite topic, but here it is. It's the basis of why everything works. Something about a cat, I think. Schrodinger equation inside the box is minus h bar over 2m, where h minus h bar are 
or, uh, or, or h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. times the second derivative of, of psi with respect to x, which is called the wave function. Psi of x equals the energy times psi of x. It's the only differential equation that we'll see probably in the course, and I'm going to solve it for you. What are the solutions Well, what function is related to its own second derivative, but a, but a, ex, exponentials can be uh, also sine, sine and cosines. We have psi uh, uh, sub n of x equals the square root of 2L over sine n pi x over L. And the energies associated with these wave functions, <coughs> the E sub n's, where n is uh, an integer uh, greater than or equal to 1, E sub n equals h squared, h is without the bar this time, n squared over 8 m l squared. What do these wave functions look like um, inside the box? For n equals 1, we call this the ground state. n equals 2, we call the first excited state. This is like an elevator in a hotel. n equals 2 is the first excited state. Just like when you go into the elevator in a hotel, they don't call the lobby the ground, they, they call the lobby the ground floor, not the first floor. Same convention in quantum mechanics as hotels. Unlike hotels, there will be a 13th floor. So this is uh, psi 1 in the ground state. Looks like this. Psi 2 has two bumps, just one period of a sine wave with one node in it. And Psi 3 is somewhere up here. Because of the square dependence on the, uh, on the n, the spacing between the levels uh, increases as we, uh, as we increase the n. So we now have an electron. We're considered, well, we have 11, or we have 22 electrons in 11 bonding orbitals, which is psi 1 through psi 11 in this picture. And what we want to do is consider the lowest energy electronic transition that we can get, which is equivalent to bumping an electron up using a photon from psi 11 to psi 12. n equals 11 to n equals 12. And the difference in energy by that equation will give us the wavelength of the photon that it took to accomplish that jump. The wavelength that it took to accomplish that jump will be related 
to the color that the caret appears. So we have psi, or so we have uh, the change in energy from n initial to n final equals delta E from n equals 11 to n equals 12, where this is called the highest occupied molecular orbital. This is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And what we want to do is measure the difference in energy between those. So we have delta E equals n final squared minus n initial squared. So just the difference in energy times Planck's constant squared over 8 ml squared. m is the mass of an electron. And in this case, we have 23 h squared over 8 ml squared. Now, what don't we know? We don't know L, but we have a picture of the molecule, so we can kind of take a guess uh, at, at L just based on bond lengths. So if L is about 18.5 angstroms, that means I have five minutes left, L equals 18.5 angstroms. Some of you may wish to go uh, home and figure out what L actually is based on the number of bonds, and it's going to be a bit higher than this. However, given the simplicity of the model that we can that we that we know what it what it is based on second quarter or third quarter chemistry, we know what the we know what the model is, and the fact that we have a real molecule, the fudge factor here is not actually that that high. So. So bear with me. Let's just say it's 18.5 angstroms long. It's a little bit longer than that, let's just say, because we made a lot of assumptions. So if L equals 18.5 angstroms, calculate the wavelength of the photon absorbed. So delta E equals H nu, which also, so nu equals C over lambda, which is H nu equals H C over lambda, where the, this is the speed of light. <laughs> lambda is the wavelength. And I'll give all of these values uh, now. And this is, again, 23 h squared over 8 m l squared. And solving for lambda instead, we have lambda equals 8 m c l squared over 23 h. Now, if we add all the numbers in, We will get an answer and we'll see how well we did based on this really simple model. So we have 8 times 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms times 3, which is the mass of an electron, times 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second times 1.85 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. I've just converted to nanometers just so that we make the scientific notation more consistent. Over 23 times Planck's constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 kilogram meters squared per second, and what we end up with is a wavelength of 490 nanometers. And just to show you the literature value for the maximum absorption wavelength is 470 nanometers. And again, I beg for forgiveness for making up the length of the box, but it's not that far. 
or 2.5 electron volts. Electron vo volts and nanometers are related by the factor 1240 EV nanometers. So divide one by the other, one or the other, to get the other, if that makes sense. Okay, so why do carrots appear orange? If we draw our Roy G. Biv color chart, I swear I'm almost done. Where is 470 nanometers? Say somewhere around here, somewhere in the blue, uh, in the in the the low energy blue range, close to uh, close to green. So if we absorb here, so we absorb, and because of the density of states, because we have a broad absorption, we're actually eliminating a big chunk where this is the max. And what are we left with, but mainly red and orange colors that are scattered, scattered uh, diffusely, which is why a carrot, because it's not a regular mirrored surface and doesn't look like a, like a mirror, it's scattered and reflected, mostly scattered light. And what photons are scattered, the ones that aren't absorbed, so these ones. And that's why carrots appear orange. I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you very much for your attention. And have a look at the homework. Thank you.